Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Shelkia Varches, Registrar of Animal Records at Melbourne Zoo. Um, so the reason I'm here is that Prov actually had their Christmas party at Melbourne Zoo and we're talking <laughs> to um, uh, our head of uh, the ungulate department who then started talking about our record system at Melbourne Zoo. So they asked me to come and, and let you guys know what we do. Um, in the early days, Melbourne Zoo is now about 156 years old. Um, I can't remember exactly how long we've been on the site at Parkville, but we were known as the Acclimatisation Society. And, and in the early days, this is from 1897, um, basically we just had a list of what animals we had and maybe there might have been some numbers of, of amounts next to them. So very little data. In about the 1930s, we started using these type of record cards that were just typed on. They only had basic information about an animal arriving, dying, and you can see there's minimal information on, on that. It's really just telling us what we had at the time. For the more significant animals, they would have a few more cards, but nothing was linked. So for Bong Su, our male elephant, he had an observation record and a faecal check record, but they're all on separate cards, so nothing was, was linked at all. Um, so then in the 70s, that's when we started looking at computerised records. And it started in the USA by Dr Ulysses Seal. He, he was a professor of biochemistry and wildlife and he wanted exotic species um, to do some research on. Uh, and he built a network of zoo contacts. So the first database was built for blood and serum norms, but on con contacting the, the zoos, they found out that zoos couldn't generally identify the animal again if they wanted to compare samples over a period of time. And most zoos didn't have their animals marked and the records were just census counts, so they didn't actually know if that was the same zebra that they'd taken blood from last year to compare. So they went to the, the regional conference in the US and proposed to develop an animal record system called ISIS. So that was International Species Inventory System. And uh, anyway, they're no longer known as ISIS for those reasons, which I do mention later on in my talk. But anyway, uh, so the proposal was accepted at various conferences and they received uh, fundings from various zoos as well as the US government. Um, initially, again, the system was just for tracking animal transactions and in inventory, so just counting births, deaths, ins and outs. Uh, there was free membership to ISIS in the 70s. <laughs> Charges starting in 76 to use the system. Uh, in the 80s, when PCs became more widespread and some more grants were received, the first computer database was developed and that was known as ARCS so the animal record keeping system. That was followed in the late 80s by Sparks, which is the system for stud books, and MedArcs, which was a separate program for veterinary data. And they're all DOS programs. Uh, we started using all three programs in 88 on um, a 286 PC, which is very slow. And that's what we often felt like doing. Uh, the registrar at the time had to spend a lot of time transferring all the information that was on those record cards that I showed you before into the new system. Each animal was given a unique local ID called the ARCS number and even though we're no longer using ARCS, that's still in the vernacular so we still say what's that animal's ARCS number. Um, it sounds better than local ID anyway. Um, but it was only six digits because that was the field limit in DOS and some of you probably remember DOS and there was often uh, restrictive field limits. Uh, they didn't record historical data at the time because they had, like currently we have about 3,000 animals, so back then we, we did have more animals, so it was enough work just to get the current animals into the system. <coughs> Keepers would record daily events and observations into daily report books and they would be handed into the registrar who would then re-enter them into ARCS. And ARCS was just, because it was DOS, it was a single user program, it, it couldn't be networked. Uh, I took over the role in 93, and when I had a few spare hours, I would go through those record cards and add the historical data into ARCS. 
So you can see this is the same card that I showed you before, but this was for elephants. So I've gone through and, and written, you know, all on arcs and I've entered that historical data that wasn't in there before. So with data sharing, there wasn't really any data sharing with ARCs. It was institution specific, so only Melbourne Zoo animals were in the database. So Healesville and Werribee Zoo, who are our sister zoos, um, they had their own databases. We used a floppy disk as a backup and sent it the, to the US once a month. And that only included basic information like what you saw on those cards, so births, deaths, ins and outs, nothing else about medical or husbandry notes. And once a year we would get a, a floppy disk in return that would have global animal inventory data. So then we might be able to see that London Zoo has 10 eastern grey kangaroos, for example. But because it was only once a year, that could have been out of date within you know, a month. Uh, later on that was on a CD. So if we wanted to see information about an animal we were acquiring, and it was really hard to find out who had animals available if it was international, they would have to send us paper copies of their records by mail so that we could review the animal's history. And vice versa, we'd have to send it to them if we were sending the animal. So this is a screenshot of Sparks. I couldn't do ARCs because um, I don't know if anyone still has DOS programs, <laughs> but... Um, the problem with going to Windows 7 and 64-bit computers means you have to use a system called DOSBox and I can only have two programs in that because one's network, one's hard drive. So ARCs, I can't show you, but Sparks up until two weeks ago was still a DOS program. And this is what MedArcs looks like and we still use one component of this in DOS. So. Um, so getting on to Windows, it arrived um, about the same time I started in the job and so they realised that the programs needed to be redeveloped. So ARCS was updated for Windows and it was meant to be followed by the other two programs but it never happened. And so yeah, Sparks is still a DOS program. Uh, so each animal had a unique ARCS number and our system was that the first two numbers are the year of birth or arrival at the zoo. So Bong Su, who's um, our male elephant, who's the father of Marley and the other calves that we've had, is 77004. So he arrived early on in 1977. Once we hit the year 2000 though, we couldn't start with leading zeros. So we started the system with A0 for 2000, A1 for 2001 and so now we're using B7 numbers as the local ID or the ARCS number. And every time an animal moved it will get a new number which is often quite confusing for the keepers because they'd see the record say if it came from Hillsville, and they'd use that number on going that's not the number that's for a, a pink eared duck because that was our number for that animal so it could be quite confusing. Again nothing was linked. Um, most other zoos worldwide use the same system as us, but others will use M for mammal and then consecutive numbering. But ours is quite good because it means that just by knowing that animal's number, you know sort of how old it is or how long it's been at your zoo. So this is what ARCs look like in, in Windows. Um, data entry was a lot easier. You could copy and paste. Data was exported to the medical and the stud book programs automatically and we sent the backups as an email attachment to the US. We could access the ISIS database on a web page so automatically we could see what London Zoo had or San Diego Zoo for example. But then there was the future vision which was to have one global and accurate comprehensive real-time animal program. So they had design meetings all over the world from 2001 asking people like myself what we wanted in a record system. It was done by a private company that had the tender to develop the system. It took them a few years. They were actually, um, they'd actually developed record systems for banks in the past so they really couldn't grasp what it was that zoos wanted in animal keeping systems. So it failed, costing quite a bit of money. ISIS got back their investment through legal channels, but they had lost quite a lot of credibility because zoos had financed this program. But they received managerial control back 
got a new CEO and put up the fees and they lost about 100 small member zoos. So the new program that they've developed is called ZIMS, so Zoological Information Management System, and only the husbandry component was developed initially, which was similar to ARCS. It was quite cumbersome, so anyone knows if you've got a slow day on the internet and you're waiting for a page to load, it can take a long time to enter data. So that was pulled from circulation and it was relaunched in 2012. Um, and that's when we started using it, when the new version was made. So this is what it looks like now. So it's a, a web page. And every time there's an update, our IT um, department loves it because they don't have to do anything anymore. They're not installing floppy disks on everyone's computers. It's, it's all done in the States. So all the husbandry data was migrated across from ARCS into ZIMS. So any time I do data entry, it, it can be viewed worldwide instantaneously, pretty much. So there's no, no backups required anymore. It's all housed on secure servers. Uh, we can share data between zoos. So if I'm transferring an animal to Hillsville, I can give them access to our records, view only, but then they can review medical or, or breeding information. Um, medical data has migrated in two stages over the last couple of years. Uh, there's still one small module in the DOS program. Um, and in April, so two weeks ago, the first stud books from Sparks migrated across, but the majority is still DOS. <coughs> so it has been a long trip. Um, it's got inbuilt features that allow trained keepers now to enter data themselves. So instead of writing it in a, a, a report book that I then enter, uh, we did develop to digital records where they were putting it into an Excel spreadsheet, but then I would still have to re-enter it. Now I can give them security access so that um, the reptile keeper can only enter data on reptiles. He can't put in a weight for a gorilla, for example, but he can view the gorilla's records and vice versa. Everyone has their own individual login to the system. Quite a few sections are using iPads and tablets so that they can enter data directly when they're weighing their giraffe. They can put it straight in there. And so my role's also developed. Instead of um, being data entry, I'm more into training the keepers in the use of ZIMS and quality control of their data. So it doesn't get finally approved until I've checked it to make sure that they're using appropriate language and um, that they've done a spell check and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, ISIS changed their name. Uh, apparently, uh, the reason why in the end, because they kept hoping that the other ISIS would change their name to ISIS or Daesh or whatever it is, but when... Um, like we, we pay them a membership fee every year and when certain banks were stopping the payment <laughs> of fees to ISIS, they said, uh, I, think we, I think we need to change. So now they're known as Species 360. There's over a thousand member zoos in Aquaria worldwide. Uh, I've got some screenshots here, but I've actually, we've got the live version, so I can show you that. So here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so this is in the animal module of Zims. So you saw the front page with the, um, the animal on it before. So animals is where all the data gets entered. So what we can, what we can do now is um, there's a crucifix toad record. Um, they're quite small, they're only about this big. We can't put tags on them, we can't microchip them because they're too small, but their markings are individual. So we can have the profile image of that animal there. So if the vets need to check it or anything, you can, you can look at it against that record to see that you've got the right animal. We have, um, this is one of our seals that we had um, quite a while ago. You can see his number is 82. So he was born at Melbourne Zoo in 1982. Um, you've got weight data in here and what we can do is just open that, click on view weight graph 
and you can see the weight graph for the animal, hopefully. Oh, there we go. Oh, no! <laughs> uh, but you'll see his weight graph is going up and down like this because that's the natural cycle of weight gain and weight loss in a fur seal. So, you know, it's also good if you're worried about a sick animal and you think it's losing weight, rather than looking at the figures, often a visual representation of the weight and you can see it trending down. Well, so you can see, I think there's an error here because that's like the loss of about 100 kilograms in a week. But I, I can't work out which seal that weight should have been for. Um, and within notes and observations, this is where the keepers record all their records. You can see this is from ARCS because it's migrated across. But there's 20 pages of notes for this animal. And then we have, I, I don't know how many of you remember Missouri. Yeah. So he passed away this week, but I'm not sure. Last time I checked, they hadn't um, updated his record. No, they haven't. So he's still listed as alive. But theoretically, if they had changed his record, that would show up as dead now. So you can see that he was at this institution the last time. You can see that we had him at Melbourne, he went to Jersey Zoo, then he went to these places in France where he ended up in a bachelor group. And then we have Bong Su, who's our male elephant that I showed you before. Um, again, from, from this screen, we can see him in the Pedigree Explorer. So it should come up first with um, his parents, which he's a founder because he was wild caught. But if we look at descendants, you can see that this is how many offspring he's got. So that's Marley. There's one at Dubbo because he, through artificial insemination, he sired one at Taronga that's since moved to Dubbo Zoo and three others at Melbourne. And we just sent some of his sperm to New Zealand last week. So there'll be a baby at Auckland Zoo in 22 months, hopefully. Um, How do you, like, do you keep the records of the sperm? Yeah, well, um, to get permits to export the sperm, Department of Agriculture had to inspect the tubes. <laughs> so we had fresh sperm yeah. that was collected last Monday morning. So we said there's three tubes. One's got six mils, one's got four, one had two. And then we had frozen sperm as well. And then they said, we want to see the tubes. And it's like, well, we're not sticking our hands in there. It's 100, <laughs> minus 110 degrees. You just So yeah, so the health certificate for that has exactly how many mils of sperm were sent. And is, the, and is that all listed into here as well? Uh, in his notes, it will be that we did sperm collection. So there's foot management, sampling, so you can see he's had blood samples. And it was the 8th of May. So you've got artificial insemination, so it was used in an AI procedure at Auckland Zoo with their female. So when they, when they confirm pregnancy, they can give the fetus an ARCS number and they will put the sire as Bong Su. And the other thing I want to show you is we're, we're importing um, a new snow leopard. So um, uh, we have two snow leopards that are aged and we're building a new facility, but we're not going to be moving them in there because they're 15 and 16 and they're having a few kidney issues. So uh, we're getting this female from uh, Safari Zoo in the UK. And the background here is blue, whereas ours are pink if you see that. And that's just a quick way of knowing whether it's your animal or not. So I've asked them to share information about this animal with me, but they haven't done it yet, because um, then the background would be white. But I can still see weights, but I don't think they've recorded any. But still, we can look at her pedigree and make sure that she's unrelated to the male that we're getting from Germany. Uh, and. 
There's a link to medical records, but I'll do Bong Su. So now, because I said MedArx has been imported, we just click on medical records. And there'll be about 500 or something. So your system would be very valuable in terms of making sure that uh, breeding programs are getting a nice cross-section. Yeah, it's really useful genetics. now. So we can say um, we don't want that animal because looking at the pedigree, it's too related to ours. Um, so yeah, so this is medical. So you can see it's split up into just notes um, anesthesia, necropsy, biopsy and everything. So it's all linked and you can go backwards and forwards between medical and husbandry with the click of a button. Uh, I was just going to show that the other thing that they've got is um, when I said previously we could go to their website to see what people had. Now species holding we can just look up, if I look up um, gorillas which is gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. And we want to look at global data or I can restrict it to just <coughs> Australia or my institution. If I run the report, and this is what the PR people at the zoo really like, because they can say, okay, we know there's 119 zoo zoos worldwide that have got a total of 786 gorillas. Mm. And all these hyperlinks mean that you can I can open the record for this mail at Joburg Zoo, or I can click on theirs and get contact information for that zoo. So all that sort of stuff's linked as well. And um, with the data sharing, Calgary Zoo in Canada is um, collecting an endangered frog species in Canada. And they asked us how we manage our frog eggs, because we do that for corroboree frogs and bauble frogs in Victoria. So I've given them access to view our data to see how we're recording eggs and hatchings and deaths of eggs so that they can um, learn from that. But they can't edit anything, but they can just view it. So that's... Um, oh, no. I don't know where my talk's gone now. <laughs> uh, no, that one. So... That's the end. <laughs> are, are all zoos actually involved with that particular... Um... Uh, all the major zoos are, but um, places like Ballarat Wildlife Park aren't members of um, Species 360, and Kyabram's not, because they're too small. What about Hillsville? Uh, yeah, Hillsville, Werribee and Melbourne. Um, Melbourne Museum, Halls Gap Zoo, Pierce Dale Wildlife Park. Are they? Are all members, yep. So with the smaller, is it because the cost is... Yeah, it's, it's... I mean, it's related to gate takings or how many people come in, but they often have to weigh up what they're going to spend yeah. that money on. Is there any intention to make, I can imagine, big very limited data sets available for access by the public? Mm. I don't think so. I don't know. Be because it's all, we're, we're paying for the use mm. of that and we pay it every year and they've just asked us to um, contribute a bit more so that we can import blood results from Gribble's labs directly into Zim's so that we can see the blood results. So, um, yeah, I, I have no idea whether they would make it open to the public. Even if um, Department of Environment wanted access, they would have to pay a fee. The sorry, the sorry, there's a girl behind you. Who's put up a... uh, yes. <laughs> Global accession number. So now they have they have one number that no one's ever going to remember. So we we're still using that ARCS number system internally as the local ID. But now when I transfer it to Hillsville, Hillsville just says yes, it's arrived, and they keep all the same data. As an international yeah, yeah. But no one's ever going to remember it. Look how old. Yeah. Can't see, but it's like this big. Yep. Oh, 
Oh, okay, so all the permits are sent often electronically anyway by the departments. So um, if I go back to Bong Su again, just because I know, because we sent his sperm off last week, um, I've got permit records in there. So, uh, so we, we need to keep hard copies of um, the CITES permits uh, no, for the quarantine permits for 18 months because they'll come and do an audit to make sure that we've kept that paperwork. But he has... Um, so in more details, we keep track of the permits. And you can see there what his site, his permit number is, what it was for, and his quarantine permit. Yep? How long has uh, the genealogical aspect of this uh, been? being present within the system. You, you're recording parentage yep. and offspring. Well, we try to uh, go back to the wild. Pardon? How long has that been a feature of the system or your, your approach to database? Value? Well, when the animals were first put into ARCs, it was just the current animal. And for the parent information, they might just put it was um, Peter and Jenny were the parents. And then when I went back and did the historical data, I would give them an ARCS number and then I would go back into the kids and change the, the parent information. But we, we try to go back to the wild, to founders. That's as far back as you can go. We don't know what the genealogy is in the wild. I mean, sometimes if they're birds that you've got, you've got two eggs from the same nest, you'll record that they're... Dam and Sire are wild one and wild two, so that you can indicate that they're siblings. How did you get this job? Me? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, st I started very young. <laughs> um, I started uh, work experience at Hillsville doing uh, zookeeping. And then I went uh, to Jersey Zoo in the UK and worked there as a keeper came back to Hillsville and then this job opened up. And then it was, um, it was a pay rise and it was Monday to Friday. <laughs> and then I had kids and it was much easier than working seven days a week. So, yeah. Right place, right time. Yeah, exactly. But yes, it has been a while. Yeah. Have you completed all your historical data? Uh, there's still, I think there's still a few birds that I have to put on, but the first card I showed you was birds and it says one arrived, don't know from where and it's like, I don't know that that's worth putting in because I'm just making up information then which is like the Auditor General is saying that's or fake news or, you know. <laughs> so if there's not enough information, there's, I don't think there's any point. But I was lucky enough to have one of the Hort staff uh, on light duties a few years ago and I got her to scan all those record cards. So they're on CDs. So they're not lost, <laughs> but you know, a lot of the information, it's not, it's not worth putting the time into. Mammals had the most comprehensive information for, I guess, obvious reasons. So yep. What about the zoo's operational documents? What system are they using? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I used to get calls from people because my title used to be animal records officer and so I'd get calls from like prov or saying, oh, what are you doing with your financial records? And it's like, it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> just, just animal records, which is really quite separate to a lot of the stuff that, that you guys do, I think. Still record keeping. But... Is there an RDF? A what? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Records Disposal Authority um, <laughs> by prof to when you can dispose um, keep How long you keep not, for no. not for animal records, but um, I'm sure there's some records that pull from us. <laughs> you know some <laughs> uh, the, the girl who shares my office is quite. Um, interested in archiving and everything so she's got a lot of the old annual reports and a lot of the old records are still on zoo property I don't think they're I think there's some off-site but there's no designated records officer for the, the aspects other than animal records I'm, there might be but because it's not really anything to do with me I'm 
I don't know, but she was very excited to meet Peter when he came. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a dumb question, but um, what determines whether an animal gets a name or not? Is it the colour of the Ah, it's usually fluffy. <laughs> most most of the mammals have house names. Um, the Lord House stick insect that we just collected from Ball's Pyramid is called Vanessa. <laughs> but that was after one of the researchers that went out and collected her. And the first two that we had were Adam and Eve. Um, everyone's got a local ID or, or an ARCS number. Um, some animals are just in group counts, like our butterflies. It's just like, well, we've got 100. There's, you know, you can't individually identify them. Um, some of the education animals have names. Not many of the reptiles do. Some of the birds do. But it's mainly all the mammals have names, pretty much. Yeah. But, but they are supposed to be... Um, respectful of the animal. So we had a keeper, we had four wild dogs and he called them Harry, Barry, Larry and Gary. <laughs> so, um, and you know, the education keeper's got a new macaw and they called him Pablo and I'm like, we've got a snake called Pablo, we've got a tamarind called Pablo, they're all South American Spanish names. And surely there's another Spanish name you can think. No, but we're too used to calling him Pablo now. So. But if, it, if it's a competition name like Marley or something, then we put in a descriptor saying, what does it mean? You know, it's Swahili for beautiful or whatever. Please join me in thanking you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Talking about appreciation. Thank you. And uh, Tara.